Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA is a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. Hello, and welcome to Voices from DARPA. I'm your host, Stacey Wurzba. We don't really do serialized storytelling on this show, but we would like to recommend that you take a listen, if you haven't already, to episode 71, The Quantum Mechanic. It's a good primer on quantum, qubits, classical versus quantum computing, and several other concepts you'll want to be familiar with because, fair warning, this one gets a little more technical than most. In this episode, we're taking a deeper dive into the quantum world with Dr. Makund Vengilator, program manager since 2022 in DARPA's Defense Sciences Office. Dr. Vengilator leads the Optimization with Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Devices Program, or ONISC. We'll get into the details on that program and a pretty major breakthrough that came out of it shortly. But before we go all the way down to the subatomic level, let's hear Dr. Vengelator's macroscopic perspective of the work he's doing at DARPA. Across my portfolio right now, I have programs all the way from sensing, using atoms and using superconducting structures, to computing, both classical and quantum, to clocks, to very mobile, field-deployable, tactical-grade clocks, to new kinds of quantum materials. But there is very much an overarching theme, which is based on the very large overlap between how to make better sensors, how to make better qubits, how to make better clocks. And in between is a huge overlap of ideas that I would like to harness to go after specific mission goals or specific applications. Mission goals and specific applications. Those are key components of any program at DARPA. We don't tend to do science for science's sake. And Dr. Venkilator was familiar with those ideas from previous interactions with the agency. Funnily enough, my first few projects as a graduate student were part of DARPA programs. The first one being a program called Jibeki that had the goal of creating these nano-Kelvin temperature atomic vapors. Nano-Kelvin, that's one billionth of a degree Kelvin. So we're talking super cool and then using these vapors on a chip, very much like a microfabricated circuit, as inertial sensors. With the idea being that, in principle, these atomic fluids, these quantum fluids, would be almost 10 orders of magnitude more sensitive to rotations and accelerations than state-of-the-art fiber gyroscopes. And in true DARPA fashion, a widely ambitious idea, perhaps ahead of its time, but some of those ideas are still very much in the forefront of cold atom research today. The other program, just as ambitious, was to find ways to get cold atomic gases to slow down and trap light, to go from the speed of light of about 300 million meters per second down to a few meters per second. That all sounds really cool and ambitious, but you might be wondering, what would the purpose be of slowing down light? The whole idea is that while atoms and ions and molecules are great sensors or qubits, they can be isolated, they can be trapped, they can be controlled, they don't go anywhere. Photons, on the other hand, travel very fast in essentially lossless manners, and so they're very good transporters of quantum information. But the fact that this travels so fast is also a downside because how do you actually impart quantum information to the photons in the first place? And so the idea is that if we can find a tunable knob that can control the speed of light, then you can get very fast pulses of light into your qubits or your, your sensor, trap them there, hold them there for a while, while you encode information into the photons and then send them back on their way. This sounds a lot like a pit stop in racing. These extremely fast vehicles that need to pull into a slower state to get the fuel and tires they need, or in the case of photons, information. Ultra-cold quantum gases, as powerful as they are, they have had a hard time transitioning out of the laboratory. And the philosophy has always been that the ultra-cold quantum gases in the laboratory scale systems are great proof-of-concept demonstrators. And then it's just a bunch of engineering problems to make them smaller. 
let's build better lasers, let's build smaller chips and so on. And somehow we can just compress the whole thing down from a five ton optical table to something on a chip. And I think increasingly we realize that scaling down a quantum system is not just an engineering challenge, it's a fundamental physics challenge because you are confronted with not just the engineering problems of how do you make things smaller, you're confronted with the fundamental scientific challenges of the fact that quantum systems behave very differently in a more integrated environment. And that is a rather kind of a novel territory because you one thinks of pure or isolated quantum systems all the way at the nanoscale. These are completely isolated to a very good approximation. You can pretend the environment does not exist. All the way at the other end, in the macroscopic realm, it's very hard to see quantum mechanics in action because the environment is such a dominant influence that any kind of quantum information or quantum coherence is almost immediately lost. But between the macroscopic and the atomic, there's an immense range of systems and length scales and energy scales where the environment and the quantum effects are almost on par. That is a huge challenge from a fundamental perspective and a huge opportunity. Because in a certain sense, that's where most relevant quantum systems inhabit. And so understanding that is essential to being able to go the next step in developing the next generation of quantum devices, whether it be for sensors, whether it be for clocks, whether it be for quantum computing. So in coming to DARPA, one of my big motivations was to kind of push the frontier of that field with the perspective of DOD relevant applications in mind. One of the ways DARPA evaluates and decides what problems to work on is a series of questions called the Heilmeyer Catechism, which were crafted by former director of the agency, George Heilmeyer, in the 1970s. At the core of those questions are these. How is it done today, and what are the limits of current practices? What's new in your approach, and why do you think it will be successful? And if you're successful, what difference will it make? Here's Dr. Mengele Tor to discuss. On the one hand, we have purely analog quantum simulators, which, like all analog computing machines, are prone to noise and decoherence and so on, gets a lot worse in the quantum realm. And all the way in the distant future are completely digital quantum computers, which are, you know, fault tolerant and can be programmed to run all kinds of computations that are intractable to classical computers. Again, in between, are there problems that are DOD relevant and intractable that could perhaps be solved by a hybrid mix of analog quantum computers in combination with classical digital computers. So it's an intermediate between analog noisy quantum simulation to fully fault-tolerant digital quantum computation. And the reason we think that this would work is that First of all, quantum systems, like most natural physical systems, are very, very good at finding their lowest energy. Just like if I tip over a coffee mug, the coffee is going to you know, flow to a divot or some region, some, some valley, and it does so naturally because that's where its lowest energy is. Quantum systems, in a certain sense, are quadratically better at exploring this landscape to seek the lowest energy than classical systems a large class of optimization problems, whether it be resource allocation, supply chain allocation, network analysis, and so on, these can be reinterpreted as an energy minimization problem. I can take very hard optimization problems and recast them as a problem of finding a minimum energy in a very complicated landscape, and I can get quantum systems with the aid of some classical computation alongside to explored this very complicated landscape to find the lowest energy. And so putting the two together, ONISC was born. To reiterate, ONISC stands for the Optimization with Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Devices Program. While we still do not have fault-tolerant quantum processors, we have what are known as noisy intermediate scale processors. So these are not fault-tolerant, these are not error-corrected, and these are not very large quantum processors. They may have hundreds of maybe a few thousand qubits. Despite those limitations, can we already find routes to solving relevant problems where quantum processors, even the noisy ones, can outperform classical processors? That was the big question on his cast. Over the course of the program, in trying to get these analog quantum processors to outperform conventional classical computers, each of the teams had explored various avenues of making these qubits better. 
you know, they're still noisy, but they're getting better and better and better in terms of the fidelity, in terms of probability that they may have an error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I would say we are still far from the fundamental limits, but in that process, some of the teams, especially who are exploring the cold atom quantum processors, realized that the massive shoulders we stood upon in terms of the quantum sensors and the analog quantum simulators, all those techniques could be oriented towards not just making qubits better, but in devising entirely new ways of controlling the processors and controlling the quantum circuits with which to perform these computations. And in particular, along with better fidelities and better control came the realization that unlike any kind of a solid state circuit, these atomic circuits are in a certain sense, very ephemeral. They are held together by light. And you can move around these light beams, you can move around these so-called optical tweezers to reconfigure which qubit is next to which qubit and also reconfigure the manner in which you implement operations on these qubits to the extent that you can implement operations or gates on a very large number of qubits at the same time. These results were demonstrated by the Harvard team working on ONISC, led by Dr. Mikhail Lukin. You can read about their findings in the journal Nature from December 2023. We'll have a link in the show notes. But we'll try to sum it up here. First things first, one of the keys here is the Rydberg atom, or atoms in the Rydberg state. So a Rydberg atom is a, an atom that has been placed in a highly excited state. If you think of this almost planetary picture of an electron around a nucleus and the size of the atom being about an angstrom in size, a Rydberg state is one where you pump enough energy into the atom to promote the electron to a very, very, very high orbit, very distant from the nucleus, to the point where the effective size of this one atom is a few microns. So imagine a single atom that is only slightly smaller than the width of a human hair. And that gives you some picture of what a Rydberg atom is. These atoms, because the electron is so far away from the nucleus, they interact very, very strongly with each other. They interact very, very strongly with electromagnetic fields. So you can use these Rydberg atoms both as very sensitive sensors of electromagnetic radiation, as well as very powerful qubits. The idea being that if you were to take two atoms, put them in neighboring tweezers very close to each other, and if you just leave them alone in their nominal ground state, they don't do anything because they're still too far away from each other to actually even detect the presence of each other. But as soon as you shine a laser beam on them at the right wavelength, you can promote one of these atoms to a Rydberg state, at which point it becomes incredibly sensitive to its surroundings and to other atoms in its presence. So what does this do? As soon as this one atom gets promoted in an excited Rydberg state, even though the laser is still on, the second atom is in a certain sense forbidden from going to the same state because in doing so, it would have to overcome the repulsive barrier. Two atoms in the ground state do not interact at all. Two atoms in the Rydberg state interact very strongly with each other and repel each other very strongly. So the way this system of two atoms gets around this is to say one of these atoms is going to get promoted to the Rydberg state and the other is going to stay, remain in its ground state no matter how long the laser is on, except you don't know which atom was promoted to the Rydberg state. So that in a certain sense is the elemental operation that makes entanglement possible. You take two atoms, you zap them with the laser, one of them gets promoted to the Rydberg state but you don't know which one. And then you take the two atoms apart now the two atoms are entangled. You know that one of them is in the Rydberg state, you don't know which one. And that's how you construct an elemental entanglement operation. So Rydberg atoms aren't a novel concept. Here's Dr. Mikhail Lukin, leader of the Harvard team on ONISC, with more on their implications. These atoms are identical. Their properties are given by nature. It's very important because each atom basically now approaches towards the qubit and the atoms are trapped in the so-called optical tweezers, which are basically focused beams of light. If you want to do some operation on many atoms, you don't need to calibrate each of these atoms or each of these laser beams individually. 
And this optical multiplexing turns out to be like a very important feature if you would like to create and manipulate these logical qubits because basically with just one change of control voltage, you can send instructions to many atoms kind of in parallel. And, you know, thinking about that redundancy is a key feature of the quantum error correction. This is exactly what you want to do in most of the cases. The fundamental idea of control over logical qubits rather than physical qubits is one of the key innovations which resulted in this kind of recent developments. So a physical qubit is noisy, it is prone to errors, it's prone to decoherence. So if you were to prepare the qubit in a specific state and just sit there and wait for a while, that information is going to get destroyed. A logical qubit, on the other hand, is a artificial construct that we create as a aggregate or a collection of physical qubits with the idea being that if there are sufficient qubits in this logical entity, then we can make the quantum information redundant to such an extent that there is a chance and a, or a high probability that every time an error occurs in any of the physical qubits within that logical entity, we can detect and correct it. So the use of Rydberg atoms in logical qubits is the first part of the innovation here. The second innovation is that we improved the performance of physical logic gates. For the first time, we demonstrated that we can do quantum logic, in particular so-called entangling gates, on many pairs of atoms in parallel with the error rate, which is below the so-called you know, quantum error correction threshold. So it's basically low enough that you can grow the system and the error improves. Again, the key innovation here is that, you know, if we, for example, create many pairs of atoms and, you know, these atoms are close to each other, we can use basically the excitation of these atoms in the Rydberg state in some very special way, which is called Rydberg blockade, where basically the, the interactions between atoms can be super strong. And you can use it, this very high strength, to sort of enable the interactions which are almost digital in nature. The idea is that if you have atoms which are far away, if you excite them to Rydberg state, they don't feel each other. But if you bring them close to each other, interaction becomes so strong that the interaction is almost in infinity. So in this case, you can excite one atom, but not two. And this is a kind of digital character. It doesn't matter how strong this interaction is, provided it's strong enough. So basically, what this really means is that at this point, it doesn't matter how close the atoms are, right? So long as they are within this kind of interaction range, so you can operate on all of, you know, you can create from many pairs and operate on all of them and do it in parallel. And basically you can have very high fidelity parallel logic operations. If you go back and look at all the error correction recipes and all the quantum algorithms, they in a certain sense assumed a certain kind of connectivity between qubits and they assumed a certain static architecture. You fix qubits in place and then you conduct operations on them. And so whenever you need to be able to entangle or perform operations on distant qubits, you had no option but to do that in a sequential process where you perform an operation between a qubit and its neighbor and then between the second qubit and its neighbor and so on and so forth until you finally have an effective operation between the first qubit and the target qubit. That is a sequential process. And if you factor in the fact that each of these operations has intrinsic errors, then as you get to larger and larger or more distant qubits, those errors multiply. This is what I would call the quantum telephone game. That as you get to larger and larger or more complex operations, the degree to which the qubits and each operation has to be perfect goes up rather dramatically. Instead, if you have a dynamically reconfigurable circuit where no matter how far away qubits are, you can just transport them with mobile optical tweezers and bring them next to each other and transport them back. Now, all of a sudden, you can still conduct or perform incredibly complex qubit operations without the same bottleneck. And that is one of the insights that, in a certain sense, at least thus far, is unique to the Rydberg qubit architecture that gets around this telephone game. So it turns out, if you trap the atoms in these optical tweezers and store quantum information in the spin state of the atom, then you can store this information for a very long time, for seconds. But more importantly, you can take this atom, grab this atom in a tweezer and move it around without destroying quantum information. By using this reconfigurable architecture, you can make a connectivity almost like a living organism. Right? You, it changes, it morphs during the computation. And together with this optical parallel control, it turns out to be super powerful 
approach to control these logical qubits. Using that approach, the team demonstrated several key elements of this quantum error correction and fault tolerance. So, for example, we did a quantum logic operation between two encoded qubits, and we showed that the error as a result of this operation decreases as you increase the size of this logical qubit. That's actually something which is quite counterintuitive. The higher redundancy, the lower is the error. So that's one important ingredient. So second is that we were able to also fault tolerantly prepare these logical qubits and do it better than we can do physical qubits. And uh, because we could create many of them, we could then take these prepared logical qubits and entangle them with each other. For example, create uh, small Schrodinger cat states of these encoded logical qubits and study their properties, study their fault tolerance. And then what we've also done, we've actually executed the first non-trivial algorithm involving these logical qubits. So we used a clever encoding, which actually was effectively a three-dimensional code, which we can implement. So our system works in two dimensions, but because we can use this atom motion, we effectively have a connectivity, which can be any dimension. So we use this three-dimensional codes to basically execute quite complex algorithms, which is kind of at the border of what you can sort of simulate classically. We have up to 48 logical qubits and hundreds of entangling gates I think this really is the first example where one could really take all of these kind of fundamental ingredients and try to use them to do some kind of non-trivial computation. So we really hope that this work elevates the entire field to kind of a new trajectory. Hopefully it will accelerate the progress across the entire field of quantum. But it, we are also very clear that there is a road ahead, right? So we are only at the beginning of this explorations of these quantum error corrected devices and fault tolerance. But, I mean, there is actually remarkable progress across the entire community in different physical systems, but in particular using these neutral atom arrays. And so there are many very clever ideas, very innovative ideas, like using different types of atoms, using different types of error correcting codes, using, you know, sometimes mixtures of different species of atoms. I think these are all really very cool ideas. And I, to be honest, I think we need this innovation to keep the progress going. This is the one area where you basically need to combine the best, the highest level of engineering and the highest level of science to really kind of identify opportunities, how to can optimize these things. Dr. Lukin is quick to note, though, that there's still much more work to be done and challenges to be overcome. The door is wide open and one should also be like sober about where we are. So, for example, this kind of most sophisticated algorithms with 48 logical qubits, they were encoded and, you know, we show that this encoding improves the performance. But when we run this algorithm, these qubits, they are protected, but they're not very well protected. And so, in particular, this specific code we use is an error detecting code. So you can detect the errors, but you cannot correct all of them. Quantum mechanics makes things incredibly difficult. There are fundamental theorems that say that if I have an unknown qubit or a qubit in some unknown state, there are fundamental laws of quantum mechanics that prevent me from duplicating that information with high fidelity. So this is something called the no cloning theorem. If you have an unknown quantum state, you can't make copies of it. That's the first impediment. The second impediment is that the very act of measurement or gleaning information about a quantum system changes it. So how do you duplicate it in the face of the no-cloning theorem? And how do you measure where the error was in the face of the limitations imposed by quantum measurement? So much of quantum error correction or the entire field of quantum error correction basically devotes its time and its creativity to coming up with ways to get around these two fundamental impediments of how do we duplicate information that we can't measure and how do we detect errors without really destroying the quantum information. And so much of the error correction schemes that try to get around these impediments rely on a very high intrinsic fidelity of the physical qubits, and they rely on a large amount of overhead. So for each logical qubit requires hundreds, perhaps thousands of physical qubits. And each physical qubit in the logical qubit must be passed a so-called error correction threshold. And the threshold is the performance of a qubit beyond which you can correct errors faster than they appear, below which the errors are being created faster than they can be corrected. So the holy grail in a certain sense is to get far beyond the threshold. And what the Harvard team, one of the innovations here was to recognize that with these new tools of control and transport, 
that in a certain sense, there are a lot of potential disruptive surprises ahead in terms of alternate avenues to error correction or fault tolerance that in principle could require far lower overhead than people had otherwise suspected. And so in principle, the number of qubits one would need in a quantum processor to really go after the intractable problems would be far lower than people had originally suspected. That still remains to be proven, but I think these latest results from ONISC definitely suggest possibilities in that direction. I think there are a lot of difficult challenges, but there are also a lot of exciting opportunities, kind of at all levels, at algorithmic level, at the level of implementation, at the level of compiling. You know, we will see a lot of progress in the next couple of years in this. And hopefully this will actually redefine a little bit how ultimately the large scale quantum computer will, will look like. Looking beyond Onisk, because it's only one piece of Dr. Mengelator's portfolio, there's a lot on the horizon. We've already started thinking about the next steps. Right now, it's a disruption opportunity called Mesquite. And Mesquite is asking, how do we explore the richness of most physical qubits? And how do we harness the concepts of quantum measurement to, in a certain sense, enable new capabilities in quantum information processing? We have gotten to a point where we have gone from thinking of measurement-based collapse or destruction of quantum information as an impediment to thinking of measurement as a way of guiding or controlling a quantum system into new capabilities. It is a rather unique aspect of quantum physics that the mere act of measurement changes the evolution of the quantum system. And so one of the questions Mesquite is asking is, how do you use this measurement to then coax or guide the quantum system into a state that it might otherwise never have reached? And in so doing, use the measurement itself as a way of creating new computational capabilities or creating new sensing capabilities. So essentially, the observer effect, or the disturbance of an observed system by the act of observation, can be treated not as a bug, but as a feature. The act of measuring a quantum system can uh, rather surprisingly or counterintuitively freeze the quantum system. You know, this notion that a watched pot never boils in a certain sense is true in the quantum world. But we can go beyond that and rather than say we're just going to freeze the quantum system, how do we use measurement to in a certain sense guide it into a place where it might never have reached? And so then how do you create the right kind of measurement and the right kind of environment to be able to coax quantum systems into very, very powerful, robust, long-lived states that might have utility in computation or sensing. And so Mesquite is taking the first steps towards that path. The idea being that once we have some genuine progress in this area, we then expand it out into a full program with very specific metrics and goals. Another program Dr. Vengelator runs is Science of Atomic Vapors for New Technologies, or SAVANT. Savant is a different program, mm -hmm. but again, there's close overlap in some senses. Uh, and one of the connections is that Savant uses Rydberg atoms, except these are not cold. These are thermal Rydberg atoms just floating around in a room temperature cell. And by promoting them to the Rydberg states, in contrast to Onisk, which is using these to create qubits and gates, within Savant, we're using Rydberg states as very, very precise sensors of electromagnetic radiation. The idea being that, in principle, these could be much more sensitive than traditional antenna-based communication systems, but they also have other disruptive capabilities. For instance, unlike antennas, Rydberg sensors can be much, much more tiny compared to the long wavelength antennas, which can span several meters in size. But they also can be made to sense frequencies or signals all the way from very low frequency. By that, I mean like megahertz all the way to the terahertz. So that span of frequency in a single sensor is not something that we have in conventional antenna-based communication systems today. To target different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, we need dedicated distinct antennas. And so the notion that you could have one sensor where just by tuning a single laser, you can detect signals all the way from megahertz to terahertz is something unique that Rydberg sensors bring to the table. And so Savant is looking at exploiting that capability for all manners of sensing and communication applications 
These advances in quantum science build on years and decades of research in the field. One of the best things that happened to me was my faculty advisor at MIT entering my sophomore year told me that it was time for me to get into research, which at the time I hadn't even known was an option. And uh, very luckily, I spoke to a few of my professors whose classes I was taking, and they gave me a tour of their labs. And the more I saw cold atom research and the very notion that we could use lasers to reduce the temperature of these atoms down to micro Kelvin, and you can quite literally walk into a lab and stare into a vacuum chamber and see this glowing ball of atoms at tens of micro Kelvin. That's probably the coldest thing you've ever seen. But the amount of control and the amount of insights and the very notion that you're quite literally steering quantum mechanics in the eye, I think that that still gives me goosebumps today. It's been amazing to see all the way from being an undergraduate working in this area to where we are now, to see the maturation of this field, to see all the insights and very, very fundamental insights that have come out of this. In fact, one of my um, colleagues, I would say mentors, said in connection to some of the experiments that my students had done at Cornell that these were experiments that were deemed impossible only a few years ago and are now making their way into textbooks. And that is not just me, that is across the field, that these are amazing colleagues, amazing scientists, and an amazingly collegial environment. Very, very proud to be a part of that and see this field continue to bloom and continue to kind of make these very fundamental and very innovative and society-changing contributions. That's all for this episode of Voices from DARPA. We'll have links to all the programs we discussed in the show notes. As always, thanks for listening.